Premise When envisioning a free society, nothing excites the imagination more than the serried ranks of leather-clad ruffians rampaging through our streets. Indeed, the word anarchy has been degraded over the centuries to the point where its true meaning has been sunk beneath endless radioactive piles of state propaganda and stories of mustachioed men throwing bombs from the shadows. In truth, anarchy simply means without rulers. The original Greek word became enmeshed with the socialist movement of the 19th century, in which the traditional anarchists believed that all hierarchical structures were illegitimate, should be dismantled, including the exploitative capitalist economic structure and the state itself. The state is defined here as the monopoly of the initiation of the use of force within a defined geographical area. It maintains a monopoly over law, money, and other key societal structures through force. A state is the sole legitimate coercive power in its area of influence, and uses that power to confiscate or tax the money of those under its authority. In Fallout, I do not imagine a society without hierarchies or even rules, but one without rulers and how it might defend itself. How does a free society defend itself against internal and external threats? In The Declaration of the Self on the Abolition of the State, I outline a more comprehensive thesis about how a free society would be structured and on what principles it would operate. It suffices here to write that I imagine a free society that has already come to pass. Pimlico is a fictional nation similar in territorial size and population to the average states of today. It even has some of the trappings of nationhood we would recognise, such as several popular national flags, anthems, a distinct culture and subcultures, as well as a fixed permanent population. It does not have national borders as such, or any political capital. There are voluntary associations of people within the structure itself, such as unions, communes, gated communities, social clubs and such. But this is the extent of any organised political structure. There is no democracy, or even a state system as we know it. The name is based on the British 1949 film Passport to Pimlico, in which a part of London legally becomes part of the defunct French state of Burgundy. This removes the Burgundians from the strict rules of rationing and allows for a thriving black market. But the film ends with the plucky citizens rejoining the UK after outwitting the authorities on several occasions, including asking people on a train passing through for their passports as foreigners. I have always liked to imagine Pimlico in a different way, not as a secessionist state, but as a legal vacuum. What if Pimlico had a similar status to the Bir Tawel region between Egypt and Sudan? The Bir Tawil area is comparable in size to London, but, due to a complex border dispute, is unclaimed by both countries, with Egypt and Sudan claiming it is the other's territory and not their own. Internationally, the Bir Tawil region is recognised as terra nullius, or illegal vacuum. Pimlico is different, however, in one key respect. It is an area that is unclaimed by any state, but it is ruled by private laws, and heavily populated by free, sovereign individuals. Not strictly a legal vacuum, but certainly no state's plaything. As a free society, no Pimlican pays taxes, or can be forcibly conscripted into an army. There are no gun laws as such, just decisions enforced by private dispute resolution companies that specialise in arbitration. Pimlicans can pay for all their services directly through monthly fees, much like people in state societies pay for their car insurance or for their cinema-sized TV on credit. They can also pay for goods and services indirectly through agreeing to provisions in contracts. A Pimlican may have subscription to a private military firm written into their employment contract, tenancy or service agreement, or in one of many other ways. 
There is also another very important distinction to be made between my fictional nation and other failed anarchistic experiments. And yes, they have existed, and for some centuries, such as Celtic Ireland, from about 650 to 1650 Common Era. Pimlico is an established and modern free society. Unlike medieval Ireland, that could not withstand the persistent conquests of the English ruling elite, Pimlico is fully industrialised, possesses a free market and all the capital and investment in arms and its militaries that you might expect. I fully admit that there is a pinch of fairy dust being sprinkled here, and that history teaches that any new anarchist society is generally crushed at its inception. We only need reference the Catalonian communes in the Spanish Civil War era, or the free territory in Ukraine. The former was crushed by both fascist and republican forces, the latter by the Bolsheviks. I explore this issue more fully in the War That Never Was segment, and particularly in the Declaration of the South on the Abolition of the State. No true free society can come about through military action or even traditional revolution alone. Transition to a free society is a slow, incremental process of spreading self-knowledge and changing perspectives, of gradually decreasing the dosage so as not to harm the addict. The drug of statism requires a detox of sane, consistent principles. Absent this, any new and spontaneous anarchistic society, let alone a free one, that arose, would be smothered in its crib by surrounding states, or any would-be statists in its midst. Even if no states attacked the nascent free society, I believe that, without this general change in attitude towards governance, any traditional revolution will just cycle that society back into the hands of a new political class, in the name of safety, or some other perceived need or emergency. Pimlico, for my purposes, is the culmination of this mass awakening of individuals to clear and consistent governing principles. My leading question is, could a free society defend itself? Any cohesive polity does not arise overnight in a blaze of revolution, but is existent for at least several generations. If I am being harsh, and I am inclined to be so, since I am confident that the antidote is good, I accept that Pimlico is a young nation, perhaps one or two generations old. On the other hand, I feel free to point out the various advantages living in a free society has for the average Pimlican. With no taxes of any kind, only voluntary payments for goods and services provided by a free market of competing providers. Living costs are a small fraction of what they are in the average state. There are also no monopolies. Policing, law and even money itself are all provided by competing companies that are all at the mercy of the consumer without a state to regulate or legislate on their behalf. There is no national currency as we know it. There are dozens of major currencies, much like a microcosm, the global currency market today as well as hundreds of local currencies and exchange schemes. Healthcare, dental services, licensing and many other things are also provided as standard in employment contracts, through charity and in your average service agreements. Since schooling is no longer in the clutches of the state, companies compete to draw talented young people to work for them with loans, scholarships and funds. Charity groups, companies, churches and philanthropic individuals all fund free schools, universities and workshops. At this stage, I think it is fair to point out what Pimlico does not have too. There is no welfare state as we know it. There is no NHS or state debt-funded benefits culture. This, of course, does not mean there is no welfare per se. Unemployment schemes are standard in employment contracts. It has never been easier to start your own business or work for whoever you like. Unemployment, homelessness, illness and poverty have not been eradicated by any means, but they are becoming rarer on Pimlico streets. But surely there are some things only a state can provide. A national military can only make sense within a unified nation under a single sovereign power or so we have been taught to believe. Now that I have sketched out a very rough outline of how my free society lives and operates, 
we can delve deeper into the matter at hand. How does Pimlico defend itself? Caging the Phantom Unlike regular armed forces in state-run societies, it is important to note the key differences in structure and operation that would set Pimlico's armed forces apart. The first major difference confronting any state aggressor contemplating a permanent conquest of Pimlico is that it does not face one major national standing army, but at least several, and probably many more than that. A standard state army has the classical business structure with a rigid hierarchy firmly established under clear civilian leadership, usually a defence ministry and, by extension, the head of the executive branch of government. Most armed forces have a chief of staff as the highest commissioned rank within the structure itself who advises the civilian government and carries out their orders. The command process and strategic objectives are very much top-down, with the political objectives set by the government. Since state armed forces are all we have known, it can be difficult to disentangle their function and purpose from Pimlico's. As we shall see later, an armed force is merely a tool used for a higher end. States have very different strategic objectives to free societies. In World War I, the statist propaganda was that men should join up to defend their homelands and national honour. What really underlay the Allied motive for war was the growing power of Germany, since the unification of the German states under Bismarck, the young German empire was threatening to become the predominant global power, eclipsing the more traditional British, French and Russian empires. Likewise, in World War II, the British state's objective was to arrest the power of the Third Reich. Peasement had failed miserably under Chamberlain, and now the method was war under Churchill. The objective remained the same, to neutralise the threat of a rising power. In the American Civil War, the Union and Southern objectives were irreconcilable. The former, under Lincoln, simply wanted to preserve the Union with or without slavery as Lincoln openly admitted. The latter felt slavery would die a slow death if the southern states remained within the Union and so elected for rebellion and secession. The running theme is state authority. Since the earliest states, this has always been the compelling factor and reason for large-scale warfare as we know it. It is only when we understand this time-honoured fact that we can properly differentiate statist military objectives from Pimlico's. Modern warfare is very much a sideshow to the greater purpose of state control. What was the Cold War but a clash of state influences on a global scale? At its core, the confrontation was not merely ideological, but about power. The West has NATO, and the East had the bloc, to balance out things. In the 18th century, the global rivalry was the imperial struggle between Great Britain and France. These were a series of brutal global conflicts fought for state monopolies over lucrative trade routes and territories. Queen Anne's War saw much of Canada annexed by Britain. The Seven Years' War saw even more French territory ceded to Britain, whereas the French support of the American Revolution saw their mortal enemy lose their greatest asset in the 13 colonies, and thus helped to restore the balance of power somewhat. Indeed, the more famous American War of Independence was an exercise in state power transfer. The war was really a process within a much larger movement, which the native political class was pushing for. The American founding fathers, including Washington himself, achieved their objective of state creation through war and political means. But why the tour through history? It is important to clarify the nature of state warfare if we are to understand Pimlico's relatively alien perspective. Since no state authority exists in Pimlico, the function and objectives of the military change sharply. Funding comes directly from consumers and not through taxation. In contrast to what we have seen so far, the command process and strategic objectives are very much bottom up with the political objectives set by the consumer's preferences. So, what are these objectives? What do consumers want from their defence provider in a free society? Well, what would you want? I'm guessing the average Pimlican would be worried about two main things. Firstly, 
Will my defence company turn on me and become another state? And secondly, defence against large-scale threats that cannot be dealt with by police alone. Let us further unpack these concerns. First, we must ask a pertinent question. If we are so afraid that our defence agency will turn on us in a free society, why are we not as afraid of the state's military turning on us now? State oppression through military means is hardly unheard of in history, is it? However, unlike now, where a state can use its military to crush dissent or declare martial law, given that its funding is practically guaranteed for a taxation system and its monopoly on the money supply, which means it can print and borrow what it needs, Pimlican militaries rely on funding from suspicious consumers who jealously guard their own freedoms. Another relevant question is who funds a private army that wishes to oppress free people? Certainly not the consumers themselves. Any bank or individual that invests in such a venture is also doomed to economic ostracism and ruin. This is not even mentioning that any private military takeover would have to account for other militaries that might oppose it. In short, creating a state through private military force is not a good business model in a free society. On funding a military takeover that so many statists imagine when considering private militaries, what benefit does the backer get? Money does not just pop into existence. Large armies are ruinously expensive and prolonged wars even more so. If a private military wants to establish a state, it must overwhelm the other powers who would oppose it, and that requires more men, equipment, and, most of all, money. Even if some wealthy individuals finance such a scheme, what is their return? An angry populace that stops doing business with them. A powerful militaristic quasi-state that could easily turn on them too. If the would-be state army wanted to be sneakier and build up its might in secret, it would require it to fudge audits and raise its prices way above its competition to pay for its increases in men and equipment. What happens to the offending army when its prices are significantly higher than its competitors? Any company that does not allow for regular weapons audits would also be deeply suspicious in a society where there is a totally free press and a highly competitive market for such an essential service. Fortunately for the people of Pimlico, they do not need to vote for a politician to lobby for laws to arrest the power of the military. They can head off its rise directly and by doing no more than keeping their money in their pockets or switching providers to a more peaceful, cheaper and sane rival. In a free market, the emphasis would be on such concerns. We know this because it is a concern now. Pimlican armies would be stringently self-regulated with regular and public weapons and financial audits to explain unaccounted for money for example bribes or payment for shady and undeclared military hardware, bounties on the heads of executives in the event of a coup, firm financial safeguards whereby the offending company's assets will be frozen in the event of a coup attempt, and many other devices that strongly disincentivize companies even attempting such a course of action. So, will my defence company turn on me and become a state? Of course not. Such a move would be economically suicidal and practically impossible. What about our other concern? Defence against large-scale threats that cannot be dealt with by the police alone. This concern leads us to the prime strategic stance adopted by Pimlican armed forces. Since they are funded by consumers, their attitude will be fundamentally defensive. Depending on the political context, the main function of Pimlico's major private militaries would be as a deterrent against large-scale threats. If states exist outside of Pimlico, then there would be some regard for this. If the threats are mostly from rogue elements, such as gangs and smaller-scale criminal groups, then the business model would reflect this too. I admit it is a strange thing to visualise militaries as mostly suited officials and strategists, but in a free society, what real need would there be for the monolithic, hard power wielded by states today? Even in our current era of state dominance, armies reflect the climates of their operation. The close of the Cold War saw the American emphasis on nuclear deterrence fade, with a renewed emphasis on resource security through maintenance of hundreds of military bases and the propping up of friendly regimes. 
In 1918, the UK fielded 4 million men to help man the trenches. A hundred years later, the British Army numbers around just 80,000 regular troops. State armies change with the political context, and I see no logical reason why a free state would need to man huge standing armies in the absence of a clear political motive to do so. Since it is unclear exactly what the main threats to Pimlico would be, Defining its military's size, orientation, and strategic purpose is much like trying to pin down a particular grain of sand in a heap, or caging a phantom. One grain looks much like the others, and the phantom can move through the bars at a whim. In a scenario in which there are no aggressive states, I confidently predict that Pimlican militaries will be small and regionalized, with only a few large military providers giving a highly competitive market. In terms of boots on the ground, Pimlican militaries will be far more focused on cyber, AI and other technical or soft means of waging war, given the huge advantages these methods would have over training, employing, billeting and equipping troops that can be injured, killed, grow tired and so on. I also envisage branch platoons, much like bank or shop branches today. I think military providers will contract with groups such as power companies, banks, with their vaults or assets, urban groups, for example large housing associations, and such to provide visible troops in the area for defensive purposes. Written into most contracts will be a mutual assistance clause, which will enable quick redeployment of platoons en masse to hotspots, so that if the bank vault is attacked, for example, by a large criminal force, The platoons from the power plant and cities will quickly converge at that point to combat the threat. In the state scenario in which statist forces attack Pimlican areas, I think troop deployment would work in a similar way, but on a larger scale. Defence companies would probably also have mutual assistance pacts to combat such a large threat, with all the proper safeguards in place to assuage consumer concerns. A state force attacking Pimlico's multifaceted and independent armed forces would resemble a man trying to cage that phantom. The tool is entirely inappropriate for the task. Even if the state manages to disable or destroy one force, there would be 10 or 20 other forces to deal with, all hostile and very well financed and trained. It is in this way that we understand the private defence providers of Pimlico, not as monolithic bulwarks of state authority with their strategic objective set by a political elite, but as businesses primed to respond to their consumers' greatest concerns, which are defence against state revival and attack from larger criminal or terror threats. The war that never was. One question that has often occupied my thoughts when thinking about anarchism is how could a free society come about? One obvious answer is through war, but how likely is this? Not very. History is quite a harsh teacher when it comes to revolutions. The very word itself implies a mere shift in state authority from one group to another, that is, to revolve. Assuming the revolution breaks out in a state society, the trend is always for the leadership of the army or some political opposition to seize the same levers of state power to continue the oppression of the revolting society after the initial surge of enthusiasm for change has died down. The French Revolution saw the third estate revolt against the crown, only to create a republic in which a new political class dictated its laws to the masses. Similarly, the parliamentarian army of the English civil wars defeated the autocratic aspirations of King Charles I only for it to enforce its own will on the people through the rump parliament of 1648. Later, former army leader Oliver Cromwell installed himself as the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth, making himself a king in all but name. As aforementioned, the American Revolutionary Conflict was exactly that, a revolving of the local leaders of state authority away from the British to the new political class. George Washington led the Continental Army not to free all men in the new United States from the shackles of state authority, but to seize that very authority for himself and for his class. What we are considering here is a man herding cats. It is not something you often see. 
In fact, it is not really something you ever see. An army in rebellion that is raised, funded, and operates within a status society will not lead to a free society. The militaries I am considering in this talk are the descendants of these forces and raised within existent and established free societies. No private military firm will originate in state-dominated societies and challenge that same state in order to abolish it. Any more than a turkey will approach your oven, pluck and prepare itself, while heating up the oven for Christmas dinner. Why is this an issue? This is an important point, because in order to accurately think about how an armed force will act and exist in a free society, we need to move away from our existing preconceptions about armies. An army that exists and operates within state-run societies will have radically different funding sources, objectives and incentives than one in a free society, as we have seen. Since no private army will ever attack a state, which in all likelihood subsidizes and contracts with it, as the United States does with Academy, formerly Blackwater, and many others, it is curious to consider how Pimlico could arise at all and without its later private military providers. The process will most certainly be gradual. Unfortunately, for any eager to transition to the tax-free status of a sovereign individual, it could take generations, or even centuries, given our current slow trajectory as a species, away from the statist mentality. This may be disheartening, but the process must begin somewhere. There is a certain intrinsic nobility in helping it along. Most people still think in truncated terms such as left-wing and right-wing and tread this well-worn path of political labelling while never grasping that it is the very fact of labelling that keeps them controllable and firmly within the grip of the state system. Statism is a tangle of dualities and dichotomies in which laws, media, education and the whole array of state tools push people apart. Women against men that is, radical feminism, black against white, Muslim against Christian. It is only by surreptitious emphasis of these superficial differences that an elite can hope to divide and maintain its control over the host society. So, to reassure the less bloodthirsty among us, a free society will not be born of some grand military campaign, waged by private contractors, or even desperate and embattled armed militias but through a long educational process in which individuals have their own sovereign nature revealed to them and shed the mental shackles of statism. It must be gradual, given the effects of a propaganda culture in most state societies that program children to exalt and celebrate the state system into which they were born, rather than question its nature, or their own nature, as the true source of political authority. Even if an armed rebellion against the state was initially successful and an infant free society established, it would almost certainly be crushed from the outset, much like revolutionary France was set upon by all the surrounding monarchies of Europe in the late 18th century. What I'm talking about here is a fiction within a fiction, a war that never was and has no real chance of happening at least in the causality of establishing a free society that can last past its first year. A society of individuals that evolve in their thinking to recognise their own nature as sovereign or self-owning entities will deprive the state system of its meaning or necessity, much like a fire will die without oxygen or fuel. It is within established free societies that we see the more familiar defence providers, keepers of the peace, not creators of it, but can they keep it? More specifically, can these defence companies withstand the power of a state? The Sun Tzu Effect So how might a conflict arise between Pimlico and a state? And how would our free society handle such a confrontation? Before we move on to the guts and glory of battle itself, we must get a good grasp as to why going down this path towards direct confrontation is symptomatic of failure. The ancient military thinker Sun Tzu may be helpful here. He understood that war is never an end in and of itself, but a means to achieve set objectives. Hence, to achieve these objectives without spilling a drop of blood or spending a penny 
is vastly superior to the quagmire of prolonged warfare. Sun Tzu fought a war as an extension of politics, which it is. To win a fight without fighting, though counterintuitive, is the best way to achieve one's ends, given the vastly lower costs involved. If you read The Art of War, you will find that the most important lessons concern non-combative issues. There is an entire section on the essential importance of spies alone. This subtler approach to conflict is also exemplified in the phrase winning and then going to war, rather than going to war and then trying to win. Applied to our setting, I believe military strategists in Pimlico will adopt this cost-effective and smarter approach to conflict because of two reasons. Firstly, it is superior in terms of effectiveness in prosecuting war and cost. Secondly, because states have and do adopt this approach now, the use of soft power in the modern nuclear age is more prevalent than ever, given that any confrontation between the most powerful nuclear armed states is practically impossible. Sanctions, frozen assets, trade restrictions, expulsions and international ostracism, for example North Korea or Iran today, are all non-combative methods of achieving state objectives that have mixed results. There are more subtle methods too, the cutting or raising of foreign aid, currency manipulations and trade also play a boring but important role in relations between powers. For example, trade and currency are important underlying factors in the relationship between the United States and China. The former is a huge market for Chinese manufactured goods, which makes China vulnerable to tariff increases. But the Chinese also hold around a trillion dollars of US debt, meaning it has the power to offload or dump that debt onto the market and trigger a devaluation of the dollar. Another example is the relationship between Europe and Russia, specifically Germany and Russia. I wonder if you have never noticed that Germany is mostly mute about all but the most egregious issues when it comes to Russia. One glaring reason for this may be because Germany has a dependency on Russian natural gas that the latter could switch off at any point. Unfortunately for those individuals with an unhealthy hunger for blood-soaked tales of battles in Pimlico's town squares, I confidently predict that direct warfare will be improbable between any state and an established free society. The options for soft power responses are just too tempting and effective. Given its stateless condition, whether business and people pay no taxes, fines, licensing fees or any other costs associated with statist systems, and given that the voluntary fees and costs they do pay for their goods and services, for example healthcare, policing, water etc, will be vastly lower in a free market with a multitude of providers. How much richer and economically powerful do you think Pimlico will be in comparison to the average state? What I am really getting at here is cost-benefit analysis. Let us imagine a scenario in which the UK wants to attack Pimlico. Why is this? Outwardly the reason may be that this society of peacefully cooperative and economically productive individuals are somehow perceived as a dire threat to it and its neighbours. In truth, beneath the propaganda, the British objective is to re-establish some state control over the area, either directly or indirectly, for a puppet state. If this could be done, then the UK will benefit economically from the vast riches any free society would have accumulated through taxation, reparations, corporate contracts and any other way its politicians can think of. The first major obstacle is how. This may appear a stupid question at face value, but how do you attack a free society? There is no civilian political structure, at least not a monopolised governmental one. There is no capital city, though to be fair there may be economic centres and other strategically important points. There is no tax base or system in place to effectively tax the population, and there would be a deeply entrenched cultural aversion to any such system imposed upon them. On the last point, one answer may be propaganda. Surely the UK can convince the Pimlicans that their way of life is bad. After all, it convinces its own slaves, sorry, subjects, through years of state schooling, 
that it is always acting in their best interests. The mainstream media generally supports questionable state actions, for example the war in Iraq, and certain biased state-sponsored groups, such as subsidized universities, unions, corporations and such, all shout from the rooftops about how we need the state and its attendant taxes and debt. Unfortunately for the British, I think we all know the answer to this. Pimlico has none of these things. There are no laws or state regulations prohibiting a totally free press or school system, which, by the way, would also be open to any child, including oppressed state citizens tired of their lot. Convincing the population of Pimlico to accept state control would be like trying to convince a lion not to eat gazelle. In terms of raw soft power, how would the UK stance be viewed by its own people? Pimlico does not exist in a vacuum. Information would flow out of it like clear water from a spring to any ears not stapled to their skulls by state censorship laws. As we have learned with the British in the American Revolution and the Americans in Vietnam and Iraq, a war can only continue with the support, or at least the passive resignation, of its populace. Expanding on Pimlico's place in the global community, how much more reach would its businesses and individuals have than even the most powerful states today? How many state assets would be in Pimlican hands? Why would any sane bank, company or investor not have assets and even headquarters and property in Pimlico? Just visualise the length of the conversation about where a successful business should base itself. On the one hand, in a state society, with all the taxes, licensing, fees, business rates, regulations, political considerations, the inequitable subsidised competition, monopolised money supply, and a myriad of other things. Or Pimlico, where there is none of this. Any board or investor would need to be certifiably insane not to locate to our free society, or at least have heavy interests there. Given this, how happy would such people be if their British government invaded and enforced all its panoply of money-grabbing mechanisms on Pimlico? These are valid questions you can be certain any would-be invader would have to ask, but let us ignore these concerns anyway and investigate how Pimlico might defend itself in the early or phony war stages of a conflict. Short of full-on armed conflict, What could the defence companies, militias and society at large do to forestall a state invasion? Quite a lot actually. Even today the emphasis is on AI solutions and cyber warfare. The military drone has entered the modern consciousness as a deadly weapon, but smaller ones are being developed all the time. Is it really inconceivable that defence companies in a free society might scale them down to the microscopic level? Imagine swarms of nano-drones set loose in a state military base or government building. They could be programmed to disrupt operations, or simply observe. Cyber warfare is of great concern now. Some less powerful but internationally ostracised states, such as North Korea and Iran, have ploughed billions in investment into hacking. The larger states also have their own cyber divisions. It is by no means a long stretch of the imagination to envisage Pimlican hackers shutting down aggressive state networks and systems in the initial stages of a conflict. A few keystrokes in the right places could shut down a government network, significantly retarding efforts towards invasion. The usual national security concerns of states would be no issue to Pimlicans, who would very likely publish any aggressive state actions towards an invasion such as build-ups on the border, in their own free press, and to the world. Another less obvious example about what Pimlico could do is insurance. Insurance and contracts will be all-important in Pimlico, given it is the most effective way to formalise and enforce agreements between consenting parties. We can be sure that defence will be a high priority for most people, and so they will willingly pay a fee to specialised companies to police and defend them. You may think not. Well, this is essentially what we have now in our state system, except that the choice element is conspicuously absent. You pay for the same universal service in policing and national defence, whether you like it or not, and regardless of whether that service is poor or even non-existent. 
In Pimlico, there are dozens of major military and policing providers on the market, and hundreds, if not thousands, of smaller ones. People would pay for cover, either directly or indirectly, directly as a monthly or yearly fee, as they do now for many things, including life, car and home insurance, or more probably indirectly through employment contracts, tenancy agreements, land grants and other legal agreements. Any sensible person renting a house or apartment will want assurances that the building and area is secure. Of course, such assurances will be formalised in the contract where the landlord or employer hires private police and even military personnel from more vulnerable locations to keep the area safe. An example today is the Moor Cop in America or private security personnel in other places. Even in pubs and clubs, the burly bouncer is a common sight. What are these people for, if not to keep order? No consumer pays for this service directly, but rather the mall or club owner does, and passes that cost down in their prices. Any sensible business will want their customers to feel safe on their premises. Crime, after all, is bad for business. In Pimlico, these professionals will be far more ubiquitous, courteous, well-trained and powerful. I apologise for the long digression, but what does defence insurance have to do with forestalling a state invasion? Well, it is not completely beyond the bounds of possibility that there would be dedicated funds for such an eventuality, just as insurance can cover theft, accident and even disasters, so would there be providers of invasion insurance. This is no small factor. Let me set the scene. Since invasion is a prospect we can envisage, so too can the consumers and private defence providers of Pimlico. Compensating victims of state invasions for damaged or stolen property, injury and such, is extremely expensive, so any defence agency worth its salt will take every step to prevent such an eventuality. It is always helpful to keep Pimlico's context at the forefront of our thoughts. This is a stateless society with a free market. There are no nationalisations here. A business rises or falls on the decisions of its owners. This is the point where I introduce Operation Bleed the State Army White, or OPSOR. I think that one obvious strategy that will be employed is an enticement fund for the state troops themselves to defect. Imagine an exhausted column of state troops approaching the border. A squaddy flinches as a trio of advanced jets scream overhead. But it is not bombs they unload. Thousands of leaflets blanket the troops, and despite the angry shouts of the officers to the contrary, our soldier manages to pocket one and sneak it back to base. He and his squad read that any enlisted men who surrender themselves and their arms to a designated location will be offered asylum, a bounty, housing and training in a field of study of their choice. This offer would also be blared across the sound waves and on any free transmission the states could not block. Such targeted resettlement funds would be willingly donated to by the people and contributed to by the defence agencies. They would fund programmes to help state indoctrinated men and women define themselves again and recognise their own sovereignty and self-worth outside of the state bubble. I can foresee large centres of learning and training there would be scholarship funds and employment fairs for these refugees. Yes, they would be viewed as such in Pimlico, much like captured Hitler youth were viewed as pitiable and indoctrinated drones as the Third Reich fell. No, I do not intend to compare state soldiers in our world to Nazi fanatics, but you must admit the regimes of most armies do go above and beyond to indoctrinate their charges to mould them into compliant state pawns. Obsor schemes would be triggered as soon as conflict became apparent and may even exist in peacetime for state refugees that enter Pimlico. Indeed, in a twisted way, perhaps the compassion of the people in our free society would be a compelling factor of the aggressing state to destroy them as it undermines the fragile state system itself. If this desertion tactic seems far-fetched, recall the defections from the Eastern Bloc during the Cold War. Some three and a half million East Germans alone emigrated to the West before 1961. The situation in Korea is another striking and heart-wrenching example. Families and individuals daily risk death and torture 
to escape the northern regime. Many among their number are former soldiers, border guards, and even high officials, such as Thay Yong Ho, former deputy ambassador to the UK. Further consider that what we are imagining is not people defecting and emigrating from one state to another, but from a state to a free society. To my mind, the rates of defection would make the German emigration from the east look like a trip to the seaside. A further issue linked both to this point and the earlier support issue coming from the status society itself for the war is the soldier's mentality. In most conflicts a state gets into, it must buoy up support and morale for the cause. But how does this happen in this case? There is no Hitler character to point the finger at, no one single group, though doubtless I will readily admit a state could probably invent one. What are invading troops fighting for? As with Pimlico itself, these troops are still human beings with drives, thoughts and consciences. These soldiers do not live in a vacuum either. Why are they attacking Pimlico's people, that is, peaceful and prosperous individuals, who have no real interest in their backward society, say perhaps pity? No, it would be very difficult for a state to justify its actions, short of a false flag operation. I know I am straying perilously into conspiracy theory, but it is rather naive to accept that no state has ever arranged an event to further its goal of starting a war. Even if most state troops are fully committed to Pimlico's destruction, it would be a tall ambition to expect every single soldier to be so. Pimlican strategists would only need a fraction of the enemy units to take up the offer before the desertions had a major effect on morale and operational capacity. So what does this all add up to? Probably a very large headache for any would-be conqueror. Before a single bullet was fired or bomb was dropped, any state leadership would need to justify their actions, at least to their own people, and overcome the vast soft power that any stateless society would possess. In this respect, Pimlico would most probably effectively head off a conflict before it even started, or in the Sun Tzu spirit, would have already won the conflict before it even began. The Russian Treatment So now that we have a good idea of how a Pimlican army would be funded and operate, how would Pimlico fare in a conventional war with a state? Extremely well. Despite all the soft power issues and considerations of the previous section, let us indulge ourselves and paint a bloody picture of how events might play out. Despite all the disincentives to invade, the UK does so, and now, across Pimlico, private military groups mobilise to meet the threat. The overall military objective from their perspective is very clear. Protect their clients' persons and property. At face value, it might seem that the British armed forces have a distinct advantage over its foes, a centralised command. Unlike Pimlico's armies, the British state is the sole directing brain behind its army, and will be more efficient, right? Perhaps, but this point overlooks a key economic incentive that drives Pimlico's forces. Coopetition is a term far less known than the competition that is so synonymous with popular images of the free market. In truth, cooperating with your competitors is quite common and necessary though I admit the concept is counterintuitive. Examples of cooperation are railway companies using a standard gauge size for tracks and mobile phone companies enabling communications across networks. The reason for this is blindingly obvious. The companies that make their service less convenient will lose out. If companies made it hard or impossible for customers to communicate with others on different mobile phone networks, then any company that does provide this service will have a distinct advantage. There is thus a strong economic motive to cooperate on this issue. In the same way, if the strategic objective is defending the persons and property of their clients, the economic incentive for Pimlico's armed forces to assist one another is huge, given the challenge presented by the enemy. Since this scenario can be foreseen by a lowly philosopher such as myself, and can also be foreseen by my listeners, we can assume that executives and professional strategists in our private militaries will also have foreseen it and worked out predetermined command structures and processes for such a situation. 
just to assuage the fears of some that the Pimlican armies might form a grand unified army and take over the society itself. Let us assume that this is possible, but let us also acknowledge that if this is such a fear concerning a free society, then why is it no fear now, with a grand unified state army that could be unleashed with impunity on its society? It seems foolish to discount the infinite benefits of a free society on this basis, when that is exactly what we have now, without those benefits. Back to the scenario. As the British forces advance, and if we ignore the problematic issues of Pimlico's air forces, we can assume that, given no capital city exists, the British strategy involves occupying key ports, resource centres and cities. Let us be generous and assume the state forces manage to occupy and hold most of these key areas against not only Pimlico's various professional forces, but also its well-armed, funded and supplied militias and similarly equipped private individuals in their multitudes. As the advance progresses, all the British troops see on the horizon as they approach each area is smoke rising and a scarlet gold tint. In each area, insurance clauses kick in. Free families and businesses destroy their own premises and homes before retreating to predetermined locations. Such a scorched earth clause is standard in Pimlican protection agreements. One area sums up the situation for the government troops. They enter Seaview, a typical medium-sized port town, but find it almost deserted. Every ship and boat has been evacuated. Almost every house is a blackened husk, and everything that was not nailed down has been taken. Even the water supply has been contaminated with drones, mines and other automated devices picking off troops as they fan out in search of supplies and civilians. With no food, potable water or shelter, these troops will need to be supplied with everything they require directly, assuming, and it is a big assumption, that the British have air dominance. The supplies could be airdropped, but why can our brave British invasion force not be supplied by road? As aforementioned, such a scenario would have been planned for, and I see no reason why the defending forces would not take out key road points and connections to retard the ground advance of an aggressive force. Bridges are blown, roads are blocked by rerouted bodies of water, debris and other obstacles. An operation that was projected to have taken days now stretches into weeks, then months. At every stage, the British forces meet with sabotaged railway lines, blocked roads and ruined bridges, and all the while facing down a population of free people, unindoctrinated by state propaganda. How much local support would the invasion forces even have? As the military situation deteriorates, the UK government is forced to funnel increasing amounts of money, bodies and resources into the conflict to account for the lack of loot, supplies and their own casualties. Many in the elite are now becoming nervous as news filters through that the Pimlican strategy is deliberate and that it is being called the Russian treatment, which immediately conjures images of defeat, with both Napoleon and Hitler's invading forces overcome by attrition and scorched earth strategies. Back in Pimlico, ordinary people in the safe zones that they were evacuated to, as promised in their protection contracts, are already being monetarily compensated for their destroyed homes and property through pre-existing war funds. These so-called safe zones are areas that are easily defensible and are also the most heavily fortified areas, defended by Pimlico's private armies. Many people also hunker in fortified bunkers and inside mountain shelters and hillsides. Such precautions, which in the real world is called prepping, is simply seen as common sense in Pimlican culture. As states continue to exist outside of Pimlico, it makes sense for companies specialising in protection and defence to offer such facilities in the event of war. A life insurance company will provide life insurance, a car insurance company will provide car insurance, and a defence company will provide war insurance. A shining real-world example is Switzerland. This famously neutral and rich country has enough nuclear fallout shelters to shield all of its citizens. This policy is perhaps a relic of the Cold War era in which the spectre of nuclear war loomed, but it is also an example of a national policy of preparation for war in a society that has not experienced it since 1815.
or the same year Napoleon was defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. I feel I have been more than generous to the Tommies. I have disregarded all the soft power repercussions as outlined in the previous section. The Pimlican Air Forces and the long odds of a prolonged war, sustaining support from the British public, but I must draw the line at some point. How long can the government troops, which are dwindling in number every day, hold the captured territory and enforce their state's authority in these areas? If Pimlico is of comparable size to a state or even a small-scale area, say the size of Wales, how long can troops hold all of the key areas simultaneously? I have conceded that Pimlico, like any other area, will have strategically valuable areas despite the lack of any political capital. But why would one area be any more significantly important than any other, given there is no capital? With no obvious targets, it seems the British must accept their fate, that they will need to hold large swathes of territory indefinitely and at great expense. Is this all mere speculation on my part? Well, not entirely. We have real-world examples of occupations going wrong. The United States still, as of 2018, has troops stationed in Afghanistan with warlords having effective control of the population in most areas away from the capital, Kabul. Another well-known American military debacle, the Vietnam War, is a classic example of winning every battle and yet losing the war. Despite American military dominance, the conflict was ultimately lost because the weary American population had had enough. As American casualties piled up, and more and more money was being swallowed up into the black hole of war. The tide of public opinion turned against the occupation and forced withdrawal. Similarly, the Russian treatment would inevitably force the withdrawal of the statists. But am I overlooking a huge advantage the British possess? Might the British use the nuclear bomb to force submission? Fallout so far, we have focused almost exclusively on conventional warfare. But what about the gigantic elephant in the room? Surely state forces will just nuke the pesky Pimlicans into submission. What if private armies in our free society use nukes? Is this not an argument against private armies and a free society? These are important questions, but first we must understand the context we are considering all this in. As of 2018, the only times a nuclear bomb was used in war by a state was at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is important to note. The bomb has only been used in anger twice in human history. And there is a very good reason why. Paradoxically, as the power of nuclear weapons increased throughout the Cold War, potential for humanity to obliterate itself in a nuclear holocaust became less likely as the reality of MAD or mutually assured destruction kicked in. MAD is the prime reason that the decades-long standoff between East and West never turned hot. Neither side could gain from using their arsenals. They could only lose in every scenario. If either struck first, the other would retaliate, destroying both. During the Korean War, the United States approached a crossroads, whether or not to use the bomb. In October 1950, Chinese forces began to pour across the Yalu River to halt the advance of UN forces and assist the North. General MacArthur wanted permission to use his country's nuclear arsenal to irradiate the northern side of the Korean-Chinese border to cut the Chinese off and prevent further invasion. Although President Harry S. Truman had previously stated that all options would be seriously considered, he ultimately disagreed with MacArthur's suggestion and sacked the commander of the UN forces when he pushed harder for the policy. Truman was right to rule out the nuclear option. If he had supported this move, he would have normalised the use of the bomb as a viable tactic, which would have had uncertain implications for future conflicts and would have had severe consequences in terms of international relations. How sympathetic would the global community be to the Americans if they escalated a regional conflict into a global one, all while irradiating part of southern China? Korea was the last time the bomb was seriously considered in an offensive capacity. By the 1980s, both East and West knew that any use of their nuclear arsenals would ensure certain global apocalypse. It is a pleasant curiosity and irony that such increased power of these superstates actually served to curb that very power, 
by ensuring an uneasy peace between the superpowers. Given this context, how sympathetic would the global community be to the aggressive British state if it dropped its version of Little Boy on one of Pimlico's cities? This also disregards the presumed main reason why the UK invades to begin with, to rule the Pimlican population. How can you rule a country of ash? But what of our last question? Will private nukes be deployed? Absolutely not. Since we already know that the very power of the weapon cancels out its own effective use in war, what justifies their use in a free society? Aside from the economic consequences of a company acquiring and maintaining nukes, what utility would they have beyond the deterrence that they currently provide? Private defence company can no more deploy them than a state, even in defence. Even if it did, and the target did not retaliate, what possible context would justify such a response and outcome? How long would such a reckless company remain solvent, if it even suggested a first strike, or even a retaliatory policy? To build and maintain an expensive and tactically irrelevant weapon makes no economic sense in a free society. If anything, investment would naturally flow into those companies that specialised in dismantling such weapons that came into Pimlico's vicinity. Since these weapons are a concern now, there will also be a concern for free people. What is the fallout of all this? Any society that maintains such powerful arsenals will severely disadvantage itself in comparison to those free societies that do not. In Pimlico, investment would flow into more useful areas, such as advanced cyber warfare and AI systems. I am happily confident in concluding that nuclear technology will become more irrelevant as these other areas see more investment and application. End game. What is the consequence of all of this? I think, given my modest considerations, it is certainly clear that a free society can defend itself. No state could prosecute an effective military campaign against an established free society. Looking past the reasons that would preclude any campaign to begin with, how do you fight an enemy that you cannot even engage? You cannot checkmate a player in chess, they refuse to play the game to begin with, and this realisation marks the end game of our analysis. The state prosecutes large-scale war to increase or maintain its power. Since such a war with a free society serves neither of these purposes, it is illogical for any state to attack free people. In contrast, Pimlican warfare can only ever be defensive, due to the very nature of the society itself. Since Pimlico is a free society, composed of sovereign individuals motivated by self-interest, what purpose would an offensive campaign serve? The question itself makes no sense, given that even the very perspective of sovereign individuals is alien to statists. There is no collective will outside of the free market of wants, needs and ideas. There is no state school system to indoctrinate children into devotion to the collective. No conscription, no state prisons to incarcerate draft dodgers. The mentality is completely inverted, so that the last thing any sane sovereign individual would want is to attack their fellow Pimlicans, who are their customers, colleagues, brothers and sisters in voluntary association. There is, however, every incentive for the Pimlican to safeguard those very freedoms that make their life so much better than the statists. Who wants to drive a Ford Fiesta when they have been driving a Ferrari all their life? Of course, for most of this talk, I have implicitly accepted the assumption that statism could even survive prolonged exposure to the blatant superiority of a neighbouring free society. With no taxation, conscription, arbitrary laws or other oppressions, how long could a true free market be suppressed or tolerated? People, after all, respond to incentives, and I have no doubt the life or death of the ageing state system we have would be directly tied to the heartbeat of a free society. If such a microcosm of freedom were to be allowed to exist, it is very hard for me to believe that it would not explode in popularity like the Big Bang. Why live in a state society with its taxes, licensing, government schools, arbitrary laws and other oppressions, when over there, there is none of this, and just voluntary, non-coercive associations of sovereign individuals? No. Any experiment in statelessness would be doomed to failure, 
without a significant change in perspective, a move towards a me-think mentality in which we recognize ourselves and others as self-owning individuals, equally worthy of respect. This is precisely why real change cannot come through the barrel of a gun. Thankfully, the human race is shifting towards the end game of the state. The answers have always been there beneath the surface. The individual is key, and if we can recognize this natural equality of sovereignty, or our equality as humans in our own self-ownership, we can move towards natural consistent principles of social governance, like property rights and the non-aggression principle, which mitigate the need for militaries to begin with. Thank you.